Okay, so today I am going to be talking about the Great Barrier Reef for my Unit 4 final project. For my biome, I am going with a coral reef. These are located within the ocean, but they are separate from the oceanic biome in itself. They are formed by dead or living coral, um, and it supports a variety of marine life, such as fish, octopi, eels, sharks, and crustaceans. The specific reason that I, or region, that I am going to be focusing on is the Great Barrier Reef. This Great Barrier Reef is located in Australia, and it's the world's largest coral reef. It includes over 3,000 individual reef systems and is one of the seven wonders of the world. This is also the only living thing that is visible from space. For abiotic factors, I have temperature, sunlight, buoyancy, viscosity, light penetration, salt, gas, and water density. The temperature is found in nearly every ecosystem and every biome around the world. This is how uh, cold or warm it is throughout the day and the night. The sunlight is also found in nearly every ecosystem throughout the world, and this is just how much sunlight it gets, how much it is affected, and one up throughout its time. So in Alaska, I know there is days where sunlight is visible 24-7, and I know there's times when it is dark 24-7 just for an example. For buoyancy, this is the force that supports the weight of an organism. So buoyancy does have an effect on which fish can and cannot be in certain biomes at a time. Viscosity is a resistant to the movement of seawater. So something that has a higher viscosity has a higher resistance to seawater. For light penetration, this only goes about 20 feet into the water give or take, depending on where you're at and how clear the water is. But this is what makes it such a tourist attraction with the light penetration. It allows snorkelers and divers to go down and explore. The salinity or the salt content, um, it has a much higher salinity than fresh water, as one may think. Um, for gas, it is the amount of oxygen that is in the water. So there's not as much oxygen that is um, gone through per se as it is in the air. And for the water density, this changes with depth. And that means that different species would live in different sections of the coral reef. For the strongest abiotic factor, I have water density and salinity. I believe the water density is a strong factor because like I said, it changes with depth. Since it changes with the depth, um, you find several different areas where one fish is prominent, and then several areas where that same fish is almost non-existent. This has an impact on what organisms can eat, who and if there are predators there, and even how their adaptations have helped them. Along with the salinity, I have this because certain organisms cannot handle different levels of salinity. Just like the intertidal zone, some organisms thrive in a lower salinity, whereas others thrive in a higher salinity. So the average salinity content or salt content of the ocean is about 35 PSU or practical salinity units, or about three and a half percent. The Great Barrier Reef, however, has a salinity of anywhere between 32 and 40 PSU or 3.2 to 4 percent salinity. Changes over the last 250 years. Um, the Great Barrier Reef has, hasn't changed. Let's rephrase that. The Great Barrier Reef has had a large change within the past 50 years, whereas the past 250 years haven't been as significant or dangerous as the ones in the last 50 years. So even within the last 25 years, the Great Barrier Reef has lost over half of its corals that is over 50%. This is due to bleaching episodes and um, climate change. Scientists are hoping that corals eventually adapt to these warming climates, which will result in regrowth of the reef. Um, 
So the bleaching episodes are caused uh, due to climate change, as I said, and this happens when it gets too warm. Um, the corals can't uh, thrive or live in these conditions, so they just end up dying. And then this is called a bleaching because once the coral dies, it becomes a white color or, as one would think, of a bleached color. And coral bleachings have been happening all across the world in every coral reef biome, not just the Great Barrier Reef, but it is more prominent and more profound within the Great Barrier Reef since it is the largest coral reef in the world. Animals and their adaptations. So the Poron nectiforms or flatfish. Um, this is a group of fish. They are bottom dwellers um, and they tend to thrive in shallow waters. They mature into having both eyes on one side, typically the right side, but not always, of their body, which this allows them to always be looking out for danger. An example of this kind of fish is flounder. Um, a flounder thrives in the Great Barrier Reef, but as someone who is from Pennsylvania, we used to go fishing in the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean all the time, and my favorite fish to catch was flounder. This is also my favorite fish to eat. Some people think it is gross or considered um, not as high dollar since it is a bottom dweller, but they definitely have some great characteristics to them. Another uh, species with adaptations is the clownfish. Um, the clownfish can withstand the sting of the sea anem anemone, excuse me, uh, due to a mucus coating that they put around their bodies to shield them um, from the sting itself. And another species of adaptation that I have for the coral reefs is the coral themselves. Some coral have evolved to have a sunscreen, as some would say. This adaptation allows for them to shield against the UV rays and the harmful temperatures, which will result in them from surviving the coral bleachings, as I was just talking about. The genetic differences between a coral that has this marker versus a coral that doesn't are significant and they can be found within the same species and members of the same family due to this one adaptation. And this specifically has to do with Darwin's survival of the fittest. This will be predominantly shown here as time progresses. As these coral bleachings become more prominent, the species and the family members that have this uh, sunscreen adaptation are going to live and thrive, whereas the ones who do not are going to end up dying. Okay, the adaptation that I am going into detail is the clownfish and their sea anemone relationship. So the, this adaptation allows them to thrive in the Great Barrier Reef and is seen, they are one of the most popular fish seen by snorkelers since they, the sea anemone are usually profound on the top of the, uh, the reef. The clownfish can't just automatically go into an anemone and be like, this is my home this is where I'm going to be. So instead they have to slowly be acquainted with the anemone in which they want to reside. This means the clownfish has to slowly touch different parts of its fins to different parts of the sea anemone tentacles um, to get acclimated to their host. And the clownfish then secretes a layer of mu mucus that allows them to become immune to the sting of the anemone. And actually the sting of the anemone is a uh, sort of flesh-eating sting. So if it won't kill a fish directly instantaneously, but if a fish does end up in the anemone per se a lot, it could have an effect on how the fish survives and how if it lives. Um, the, the clownfish then secretes the mucus and this will allow them to become immune to the sting as I was saying. And when the fish then resides in the anemone, it that then runs off any predators and parasites of the anemone, ultimately keeping it healthy. So this is a very symbiotic relationship between the two of them. And I think it is really cool. And I have been fascinated with this ever since I was a kid. Um, and a lot of people are fascinated with clownfish due to the movie uh, Finding Nemo. It's a 
Disney CGI movie. I'm hoping some of you have heard about it. It is a classic. If you haven't, I totally recommend watching it. Um, and here's a little fun fact. Clownfish can also change their gender. So all clownfish are born male and they can change into females. Now, not everyone does this, but this is done to assert dominance per se. And it obviously keeps the populations afloat. Um, but once they change their gender from male to female, it is irreversible and they can no longer go from female to male. So it's a one-time choice and I thought it was pretty cool that they were able to do this. Um, any other relevant information I have is that the fish, they hide in the coral from predators and not just one single fish. There are several different species that do this and this allows them to, uh, like I said, hide and, and seek shelter from predators. Um, the Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest reef, and it includes over 3,000 individual reef systems. And it is one of the seven wonders of the world. And it is the only living thing visible from space. I thought this was pretty cool because I never realized how large this living contraption was personally but I've always been interested in the Great Barrier Reef since I was a kid. And I thought it was really cool that I was able to do my project on this specific biome. And I've learned a lot. I didn't realize that the Great Barrier Reef would be, like a coral reef would be its own biome. Um, I've definitely learned a lot about biomes in general since we started this, because I didn't realize how many there were. And I didn't realize how many animals had adaptation specific to their biomes and the barrier reef I believe is a great example of this due to the different species and uh, temperatures and the climate change everything that combines to make the barrier reef itself uh, that's why I think it's such a good example of this and finally I have all of my citations um, so thank you